Hello, everyone. I'm Ramona Georgis, the editor and co-founder of San Jose Spotlight, the city's first independent nonprofit news organization. And today, as our country grapples with an unprecedented public health crisis, a looming economic recession, a reckoning on systemic and institutionalized racism, and a divided country, we look to our leaders in Washington for answers and for relief. Today, it is my privilege and honor to speak with Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren as part of our San Jose Speaks series. And Congressman Lofgren was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1994, and she represents the 19th District of California, which covers San Jose and Silicon Valley. She currently serves on the House Judiciary Committee and chair of the Subcommittee on Immigration and Citizenship. She also serves on the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee and chairs the Committee on House Administration. And as a former immigration attorney and immigration law professor, Congresswoman Lofgren is recognized as an established champion of comprehensive immigration reform, and she's a national leader in immigration policy. She is also known for her work on patent reform, copyright issues, digital rights, and net neutrality. And Congresswoman Lofgren is also the chair of the California Democratic Congressional Delegation. And in 2020, she was appointed by Speaker Nancy Pelosi as a House impeachment manager during the impeachment proceedings of President Donald Trump in the US Senate. And interestingly, this was your third time being part of these type of proceedings, Congresswoman. She was also present for the impeachment proceedings against Nixon and Clinton. So it is such an honor and privilege again to have you here, Congresswoman. We know you're very busy. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and to answer some questions from our readers. We really appreciate that. Well, thanks very much. Um, it's my pleasure to be able to join you. I'm proud uh, that Spotlight exists here in San Jose. I read you every day and I'm <laughs> glad that we have an independent nonprofit news source right here in our community. We have, as we know, very challenging times that we're facing uh, from the pandemic uh, to uh, the facing of the racial disparities that uh, the COVID pandemic has uh, disclosed to everyone, as well as the uh, murders of African Americans in this country and the unprecedented uh, demonstrations and demand for justice and change uh, that those murders have uh, prompted. So we have a lot uh, on our plate. I think it's important that we uh, try and work on these issues together mm -hmm. successfully um, and face our challenges with open eyes, but a willingness to harshly uh, examine our past and uh, and to embrace the future that we, we can have if we honestly uh, examine uh, what needs to change in our country. Absolutely, and you are in the thick of all of this in Washington, and as you mentioned, it's such an extraordinary time for our country right now. And we'll get into some of these specific um, issues. And you started with COVID-19, that's I think a really important place to start. You know, right now there's so many people in our country who are suffering. Um, they've been out of work for months. Businesses are closing. People are being laid off. They're losing their health care. Um, yep. I know that there is some legislation going through Congress right now to help provide some relief, specifically the HEROES Act. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, for the latest update on the HEROES Act in Congress. And, and how does this package support families and businesses uh, that are affected by COVID-19? Well, it's an important uh, bill. It passed the uh, House of Representatives on May 15th, and each of us uh, who chairs a committee who had who wrote part of it was invited to be one of the co the original co-sponsors. I was. Uh, the House Administration Committee has jurisdiction over elections, and we have a big selection, a big a section of the bill that provides for securing the elections in November, making sure that people have an opportunity to vote by mail, uh, that the states have the money. But getting to your question about what's in the bill for families, uh, it's a lot. Uh, it's sitting on Senator McConnell's desk right now. They have not taken the bill up. 
and it's urgent that they do so. You know, we have nearly a trillion dollars in the bill for state and local governments. And that's important because states and localities have had a huge um, budget shortfall. I mean, their revenue has just disappeared. And so to the extent that we rely on those uh, governments to provide services, if we don't get some relief to them, there's gonna be massive cutbacks and layoffs and we will not be able to get the support to communities that's necessary. But we also have direct funding uh, for individuals who've been adversely impacted by the pandemic. A second round of direct payments for families and individuals, an increase in food security and staff benefits by increasing uh, the benefits by 15%. We expand the uh, Paycheck Protection Program uh, and we expand eligibility to nonprofits of all sizes. We provide funding for education. As we know, uh, we, we've got to get our schools safely opened, not only for the benefit of children, but their parents who also uh, need uh, their, their kids to be in school. We've got funding for more testing and the postal service and the like, uh, but it's a very important measure and it has to be passed soon uh, because the protections in the CARES Act, which was the first relief act, uh, are expiring and uh, families who are facing evictions, a cutoff of unemployment benefits, uh, this has to go through and we're hoping that the Senate will get off the dime and pass it. Absolutely. And, and, you know, you did bring up the uh, 2020 election, and I know you mentioned that you introduced um, a bill on election security provisions in the HEROES Act. How will that help with the 2020 election and the likelihood of moving to an all-male ballot election? Well, if, if the Senate approves what we sent, it would have a very important uh, impact. It basically uh, requires that every uh, American citizen who's registered to vote uh, be given the opportunity to vote by mail if they choose. And if the pandemic is extent uh, 60 days before the election, that registered voters should be sent uh, an absentee ballot in the mail, postage paid, as we do here in California. It also provides for robust early voting opportunities because some people, for example, there are disabled people who have to vote in person, uh, don't have the luxury of the absentee uh, ballots because of a disability or by personal preference. It provides for uh, funding uh, to recruit poll workers for uh, additional protective equipment uh, for poll workers, as well as just the funding to transition to uh, tracking the ballots, uh, protections for uh, and due process protections for people whose signatures are uh, disallowed on the absentee ballots. It's a whole package, uh, same day registration um, for people who, uh, uh, who are alleged to have not been properly registered. You can go and, and register on the same day. It's, it's elements of the first bill that we introduced in the Congress when the Democrats took the majority, HR1, which is the biggest ethics in an election reform bill passed in modern history. Uh, it takes those elements and puts it in the HEROES Act along with funding uh, for the states to run their elections. It's very important. And that's really helpful, Congresswoman. And as you know, here in Santa Clara County, um, most of our voters prefer to vote by mail and we've rolled out all mail elections as well and have seen in the primary in March an increase you know, in voter turnout. So. Um, and participation, so that's that's really important. You know, um, it's interesting that by the polling, most Americans in both parties want this option. Uh, the president is trying to make this a partisan issue, um, but really most voters, Republicans, Democrats, and independents want the option of voting by mail. I mean, just as the president votes by mail, uh, and, and the First Lady votes by mail. It's convenient for them. It's convenient for other Americans as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Well, um, want to talk a little bit more about legislation related to COVID-19 and, and how we can provide relief to families who are hurting in our community. Um, what additional legislation has been proposed to help local governments as they face increasing expenses due to COVID-19 um, and declining revenue? And you mentioned, you know, the HEROES Act being on Mitch McConnell's desk. Can we expect this legislation to be enacted this year or next? I mean, how do we get these things moving? Well, I'm hoping that will be this month. Um, if we don't pass it this month, uh, a lot of uh, states and local governments are just going to go off a financial cliff and uh, a lot of their families will go with them. Um, we can't wait till the fall. We can't wait till next year. I mean, we've got to get this uh, assistance uh, out uh, to these communities, to the small businesses, to the families who need unemployment extended uh, and, and the like. Um, not only is it what families need, but uh, it's what the economy needs. Economists from both the left and the right have said, we need to get some funding out the door uh, to keep the economy from completely collapsing. The CARES Act uh, did have, it was not without its uh, faults in implementation, that's for sure. And, and believe me, I heard that and my office helped lots and lots of people cut through the red tape. The administration of it was terrible in some cases. But it did provide benefits to lots of people, kept them in their homes, kept their businesses alive. We need to continue to do that, and uh, that's what this bill would do. Right. And you're know, speaking of businesses, there's, I think, across the country, and even here at home in Santa Clara County in Silicon Valley, there's this push to try to reopen businesses and get people back to work quickly. And I know that our, you know, public health officers, Dr. Sarah Cody, has faced, you know, considerable criticism for not moving fast enough, right? Now we're seeing the cases rising once again and potentially having to pull back some of those freedoms. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, obviously the push to reopen the economy and get people back to work, along with protecting folks and protecting their public safety and their health. What do you think Santa Clara County can do to strike that balance between protecting the local economy and protecting people's public health? Well, I think most people think protecting the health has to come first. Um, We've got uh, essential workers all the way from doctors in hospitals to uh, postal workers to grocery clerks uh, who don't have the ability to telework because they're hands-on workers. But a lot of people in Santa Clara County are able to work from home. A lot of uh, people, if you're, if you're a computer scientist, a lot of them are working from home. So to the maximum extent possible, I think we should continue the telework for those professions where it's possible. Uh, I think that I don't, I think Dr. Cody has done her very best uh, to try and uh, protect the health of our community. And I realize that she's now made some other suggestions about how we can uh, reopen in ways that are um, sustainable uh, and while still protecting the public health. So uh, I'm very interested in that. I tend to support the scientists and doctors. Uh, I am not a scientist or a doctor, and I, I want to uh, put the scientists ahead of the politics of this thing. That's what the country really, uh, really needs. I'll just say this, unless we can figure out a way to safely open our schools, uh, the parents who are employees are not going to be able to work. Uh, you can't leave a five-year-old or an eight-year-old home by themselves. And so, uh, you know, in addition to educating children, uh, schools allow working parents to go to work. And if that isn't figured out, then all of this is really just a conversation. Right. That makes sense. And Speaking of public health, one issue that has become so partisan and surprisingly to some, including me, um, <laughs> it has become such a surprise to see the reaction to face coverings. You know, some people obviously support them, some do not. Um, wanted to sort of get your thoughts on that because I know it has become a political weapon on, for so many people who refuse to wear a mask. Um, and it has obviously been proven that it does reduce the risk of spreading COVID-19. What are some ways we can help promote the importance of face coverings from a public uh, safety standpoint? Well, it's just a matter of uh, science and medicine. It has nothing to do with politics. It shouldn't. 
Um, you know, I think people uh, have been manipulated by, in some cases, uh, into thinking this is some kind of a political statement when it has nothing to do with a political statement. Uh, people uh, will gain some protection for their own health by wearing a mask and they will certainly protect others by wearing a mask and to think that that has something to do with personal liberty that's like saying well i have the freedom to you know go out without pants on no you don't and you and you should wear a mask while you're at it i mean this is something that is just uh i think a reasonable thing to do in the middle of a pandemic and i think it's it's very unfortunate that uh, some have tried to make it into something it is, and it should have nothing to do whatsoever with political viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Congresswoman. And I want to switch gears a little bit now from the COVID-19 pandemic to talking a lot about police uh, reforms, police brutality, police violence, as you mentioned, you know, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Um, you know, across the country, there's a reckoning on systemic racism and, and how we combat you know issues of implicit bias in our in our police officers and our police force i wanted to ask you you know what is congress doing regarding police reforms and accountability well we have uh just passed a bill um that i'm on the judiciary committee as you mentioned the judiciary committee marked this bill up uh and it has some important reforms uh that we worked through let me just back up to say that when we saw the, more, the murder of uh, George Floyd, I think it had uh, a tremendous impact in this country and really around the world to watch that murder it was shocking. And there is a strong sense that now, finally, we need to take some action uh, to stop that sort of thing. We know that uh, a bill that would limit police violence is not all that needs to happen but it also must happen. And so we passed the uh, George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. It was uh, spearheaded by the Congressional Black Caucus. And uh, Karen Bass, who is the uh, chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus, is also the chair of the Crime Subcommittee on the Judiciary Committee. So she played a very important role in helping to put this bill together. Uh, it was, uh, it specifically bans the chokehold uh, it, and bans no-knock warrants in drug cases. It mandates improved training standards. It requires that deadly force may only be used as a last resort. It limits the transfer of military equipment to state and local law enforcement agencies, mandates the use of body cameras. And here's the important thing, it increases accountability. Right now, there's something called qualified immunity uh, for police officers. Essentially, victims can never recover damages because uh, this court devised doctrine really precludes a finding of misconduct on the part of an officer that uh, engages in wrongdoing. This eliminates that qualified immunity, which is an important accountability uh, measure. Would also uh, allow for in cases where it's appropriate, where someone has committed a, a violent act like the murder in, in Minneapolis, um, where you could have an easier uh, route to prosecution. Uh, it strengthens the ability of the states and the Department of Justice to investigate law enforcement agencies that have problems. It creates a publicly available national database of police misconduct. It requires officers to be certified before they are hired and would prevent the kind of thing that we've seen in the case of the officer who murdered uh, uh, George Floyd, uh, who had moved from place to place. So you get fired one department, then you go down the road and get hired in another one, this would prevent that. So does it solve all problems of racism in America? No but it is the strongest uh, police uh, reform measure that's ever been considered in the, in the Congress. Uh, we worked very closely with all the civil rights groups, getting their advice as we crafted the bill. It was passed and is waiting on Senator McConnell's desk, hoping that they will take it up. Right, absolutely. 
Um, and, you know, along with those type of reforms, a lot of people around the country and even in San Jose are calling for defunding police departments, which essentially just means divesting that money, right, and moving it to community services and social workers and allowing them to handle those type of calls instead of police officers. Um, I want to know your thoughts, Congresswoman. I know that's primarily a local issue, but what are your thoughts on the defunding um, idea? And do you think that this model would work in San Jose? Well, that's something, the, the Congress doesn't decide how police departments are organized. Uh, each locality does that. And hopefully they do it with an eye to what each community needs. Uh, you know, do you need a burglar unit uh, or not? Do you have actual police officers doing traffic or do you have uh, trained but non-police officers doing traffic enforcement? That's a local decision. What we did was to say what you can't do is have impunity with police violence. That's what the, the law that we passed did. I do note that um, uh, there were some disappointing things that I saw, um, I think we all did, uh, in the police response to the demonstrations here in San Jose. Um, things that I was uh, very disappointed to see on, on behalf of uh, police officers, and I think there is a strong need uh, to um, correct that misconduct. And it may well be that the uh, city of San Jose will look and see, you know, do you want an armed police officer to be responding to a call that is not a crime? Um, a lot of calls are for people who are in mental health distress. You know, is that the best response? Um, pro maybe not. Uh, you know, I think sometimes the presence of an armed officer can actually aggravate a mental health situation. So I think that's something the local community needs to work through. I'm sure that there's room for improvement, um, but um, it's not a decision I get to make as a member of Congress. Right, absolutely. And you know, we've heard even officers say that the 40 hour training or whatever it is that they receive on mental health is just not enough. It's just doesn't- At the same time, and we, we know that, that we need, at least I believe, we need uh, police departments to be able to respond to violent situations in some cases. If you have somebody who's in, you know, who's got a, uh, an assault weapon, who's opening fire in a school, you know, you need a police officer, not a mental health worker. You may also need a mental health worker, but uh, you need the capacity to protect the community. I, the people who I've heard say that they want to defund the police don't dispute that. What they're talking about is having a panoply of responses to a variety of situations that occur in our communities. Right, that makes sense. And, you know, from your experience, what do you think we can do as a community and as a country, really, to end systemic racism and oppression? Oh, well, it, you know, if you take a look, there's been some tremendous uh, data that's come out about the uh, economic disparities that go back, really, to slavery, um, where African Americans with uh, advanced degrees on average, don't earn more than uh, Anglo-Americans with a high school diploma. Now, why is that? Um, the accumulation of wealth among African-American families, even uh, African-American families who are thoroughly middle class, their wealth is considerably less uh, than those of their white neighbors and in many cases not white neighbors because we still live in a segregated society in much of the country. So I think uh, we've got a, a big job ahead of us, but it starts uh, with recognizing what the issues are. We are going to be voting on, and I know some people may scoff at this, but it's something that the Black Caucus has asked us to do, is to form a commission uh, that seriously looks at the condition especially of African-American men in this country, and to, and to make recommendations to the Congress promptly on the steps uh, to take. Uh, I think that that is one of many things that we are going to need to do. Uh, but we're at the beginning of our journey, not the end. And 
I, I'm not given Mitch McConnell's uh, primacy in the Senate right now. Uh, we can't even get our police bill, uh, which through the Senate so far, which is really the, the smallest piece of what needs to, to happen going forward. Right. And, you know, switching gears again, Congressman Lofgren, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about immigration issues. Again, this is your specialty. This is what yeah. you've built your career around. And I know um, you have a lot of important thoughts to share with our readers and our viewers. Um, uh, and Santa Clara County was one of the counties that was most affected by the recent Supreme Court decision upholding the DACA protections, a temporary yeah. victory, but as we know, that can change. Um, do you think this decision will lead to a permanent solution on DACA? And um, taking it a step further, do you think that it could lead to comprehensive immigration reform? Well, I doubt it right now. I mean, we passed a bill uh, to protect the DREAMers and TSP uh, recipients last year. It was over a year ago that we passed the biggest DREAMer protection bill ever considered by the Congress that went through my subcommittee and I managed it on the floor and it passed and it's been sitting in the Senate ever since. That would provide an enduring uh, solution for DREAMers and uh, TPS uh, holders. Um, it's not everything that needs to ha happen in immigration reform, but it is an important step forward. Uh, it's worth noting that the Supreme Court's decision was based on the Administrative Procedures Act not the merits of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. So uh, the president could try again, and rumor has it that he intends to try again uh, to remove the protections from DACA um, recipients. The, the thing is, he may not have enough time to do that. It does take uh, some time to go through the proper steps uh, to uh, notice it, to um, solicit comments for 30 to 60 days in the federal register and then a change of rule and then there'll likely be litigation and you know he's got less than six months uh, to go uh, before the election so I think if he is reelected uh, clearly uh, the dreamers will be deported um, if he is not reelected then we have an opportunity to reform our immigration laws from top to bottom, and I am eager to do that. It's way past time that we get that done. Also, a judge recently ordered immigrant children to be released right. from detention centers to avoid contracting COVID-19. Wanted to ask you, what do you think can be done for adults to get them released from detention centers and to keep uh, family units intact? Well, actually, that was Judge G in Los Angeles, and she ordered the children released because the Trump administration is violating the Flores Agreement that they, I mean, they're basically, once again, violating the immigration laws and settlements that they've agreed to. Um, one concern I have is that we might uh, go once again to pulling children away from their parents, and we uh, have sent uh, a communication uh, to the president indicating that that would be an unacceptable response. In fact, people in immigration detention are not criminals. Uh, they are civil detainees. And we had a hearing in the um, immigration subcommittee uh, about a month and a half ago about the prevalence of, of COVID in the detention centers. ICE uh, is doing nothing to protect not only the detainees in, in these facilities, but their own staff. Um, we've had a number of ICE staff and contractors uh, be positive for the disease. Then of course they go home and expose their neighbors and family. Uh, so this is something that is, it, it is about the detainees, but it's also about the staff and the, the, the communities that those staff live in. The, the behavior of ICE in terms of dealing with this is completely irresponsible. There are many, uh, unless the individual who's being detained is a risk, uh, poses a, a risk to uh, the public, they should be out of the facility and on an alternative to detention, an ankle monitor, or some other measure that allows us to keep track of where they are uh, and not uh, cooped up where they're not even testing everyone, uh, but it looks like 
you know, a majority of the detainees are turning up positive. It's really scandalous. Right, it's a really frightening situation. And, and on that note, Joanne Fierro, um, who's one of the folks who's watching right now, she asked a question that's related. So I wanna real quick ask that question and then we have a few more. Um, okay. Take more questions and then we'll, we'll go ahead and take more from the readers. Uh, but she is asking, can you give us an update on how many children are still in the ICE detention centers um, you know, with the July 15th deadline coming soon? I don't have that exact number. Uh, and ICE uh, is not very forthcoming in terms of responding to the inquiries that we make. Um, you know, when the president um, refused to respond to any of the subpoenas uh, on other matters, the whole um, administration really stopped responding to the legitimate request for information from uh, the Congress. So I do not have that number, but I will say it's substantial. Um, it may be that they don't have a complete figure on it either because they, they did not even realize that they had lost children when they separated children from their parents uh, some time ago. In fact, when we had the Inspector General uh, of the Department of Homeland Security examine that, uh, she came back with a report indicating that uh, the department separated what she described as pre-verbal children from their mothers without um, giving them, taking their fingerprints, taking a picture, or giving them any kind of identifying so they can't track whatever happened to those children. So they're, you know, their children they've lost, they, they will never find again. Uh, but that's really not the question of how many are incarcerated. Judge G's order uh, is is not um, really appealable. I mean, the department, the, the government has agreed to the Flores Agreement, and they have to release these kids. Right. And I want to ask one more um, pre ring question, then we'll switch to all reader questions. Right. And you mentioned a couple of really important bills that are sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk, and obviously Republicans control the Senate. And there's a lot of gridlock uh, in Washington right now. Do you see an end to this in the near future? Well, we have an important election coming up in November. And uh, it is possible that the uh, Senate majority will change. And that doesn't mean that the Senate Democrats and Senate uh, and House Democrats will agree on everything, but at least we'll be pulling in the same direction. Um, so that, that could help. Absolutely. And I have two questions on this next topic. So I'm going to try to combine them into one. One is a pre-submitted question from Chris in San Jose. Another one just came in from Marsha, who's watching live. And this deals with Trump being defeated, but essentially staying in office. Um, so the question is, how are you and how should we be preparing for the scenario where Trump is defeated? that he declares the election invalid and refuses to leave office. And, you know, Marsha adds that, you know, he could lose election and remain president through exercising his presidential powers. So is this possible? And, um, you know, what can be done? Well, he really doesn't have much authority when it comes to that. Congress is uh, also the, the official counter of the electoral college votes, not the president. And so, as a matter of fact, I expect to be in the House chambers uh, uh, as the chair of the House Administration Committee. I have a role to play in helping to count those votes uh, for the Electoral College. And in the scenario that's been described where the president has been defeated, there's no, there's no mechanism for him to stay in office uh, past January 20th. Uh, I should also note that federal law, the Presidential Succession Act, sets the time of succession in the unlikely event of an inconclusive election. And in that scenario, the Speaker of the House is next in line uh, to become president. And we, of course, would expect that would be Speaker Pelosi. She'd make a great president. Um, but I don't expect that to happen. Uh, the president, uh, if he's defeated, uh, will be defeated. and. Um, you know, I can't, I guess with this president, you never say never, but uh, once he has been defeated that he would refuse to leave the White House, I think is, is unlikely. 
Um, you know, we, we have a, a very important tradition in this country of the, uh, the transition of power being peaceful and um, that's what keeps us free. Mm -hmm. Do you think he's gonna lose? Congresswoman Lofgren, what's your, what's your sense? <laughs> no, I mean, I didn't vote for him and I, I think he's been a terrible president. Um, so I hope he loses, but that's up to the voters of this country. Uh, they decide and I accept whatever they decide. Okay. And a few more questions here from our, from our readers. Um, one has to do with the bills we talked about for relief from COVID-19. Um, this comes from Enrique and San Jose. Are the House Democrats working to reverse the giveaways to the wealthy and to banks under the pandemic relief bills and provide support for the families who need it the most? Absolutely. It was what the way they administered this, I mean, wasn't even in compliance with what the CARES Act said which was that if you had access to other cap capital, you weren't eligible uh, to accept the funds. And of course, we had uh, the Treasury Secretary um, made available these funds to uh, uh, corporations that had access to other capital. Uh, it was supposed to be on the basis of first come, first serve, and we discovered that some of the banks didn't do that and funneled the money into uh, well-heeled corporations instead of the desperate uh, small businesses that the funds were uh, directed for. So we've made some changes in the HEROES Act to preclude that uh, from happening again. Um, I submitted some testimony to the House Committee on Small Business about some of the serious rollout flaws here in San Jose. And I heard from a lot of small businesses and nonprofits, we went to bat for them. But you shouldn't have to go to your Congress member to get the relief that the bill outlines. That should just happen uh, without intervention. So we've made some changes. Uh, we need more transparency. Right now, the Secretary has refused uh, to provide information to the Congress about who got the loans. So uh, we're pressing him, and I think that's about to change if it hasn't in the last day. Um, and we've got other language to ensure that the funds go to um, uh, Main Street businesses, small businesses, minority-owned businesses, and we've carved out some additional funds for extremely small businesses um, as a set aside, so that could not be uh, scooped up. But I will say, even though it was infuriating what happened, um, we also, I'm hearing from p businesses here in San Jose who, who were saved, who actually did get the funding, and uh, we're in business today because of the bill. So we need to do better, but we also did something. That's a relief to hear. And um, another question coming from our readers is from Lucy uh, Giever, and she's talking about the concerns with, um, you know, people losing their jobs and then losing their health care along with that. Uh, she wants to know, do you support Medicare for all? And how can we get there? Well, I'm, I'm a co-sponsor of that bill along with the competing bills. Uh, there are, you know, there's like seven or eight different bills, all of which, none of which really could be, become law as written, honestly, but all of which would make fundamental change. So we, we need to fix the system that we have now. It is not, uh, it is not working. I'm also, um, <clears throat> Pramila, my colleague, <clears throat> on the um, Judiciary Committee has a Health Care Emergency Guarantee Act, which brings um, uh, relief in certain terms of services and prescription drugs uh, for the duration of this emergency. And I think uh, that is something that's very important. In the bill, also the HEROES Act, we have um, existing coverage we subsidize the cost of COBRA premiums, which isn't for everyone, but will help some people who have been laid off. And we've also uh, tried to reopen uh, the um, enrollment for uh, covered, well, not just covered California, because they did that anyhow, but for the um, exchanges for the uh, ACA. So we do need um, to expand Medicaid. We do need to change, um, the system of how we deliver healthcare insurance in this country. 
I don't know that we're going to get that done during the pandemic, but uh, certainly the pandemic has opened everyone's eyes to the disparity and how fragile people's connection is uh, to health insurance. You lose your job, you're out of luck. If it weren't for the ACA, um, you know, and COBRA and Medicaid, uh, it would be even worse. And of course, we've got the Trump administration in the Supreme Court right now asking the court to invalidate the uh, Affordable Care Act. Millions of people would be out of health care in the middle of pandemic if they succeed in doing that. And we have just a few more minutes left with you, Congressman Lofgren. So thank you again for your time and for your patience. And we're going through as many of these questions as we can. And the ones that we don't get to, I will forward them to the Congresswoman's <laughs> office and see if we can maybe get some answers. So I apologize that we couldn't get through all of them today, but we'll do our best to get answers after. <laughs> but, um, but if we can sneak maybe one or two more in, I think this one is a really, really important question. It comes from Natasha. Um, and she's asking if you could please speak to ICE's policy, a new policy um, that would prevent foreign students from staying in the US this fall if their universities are doing all the classes online, if they're doing 100% distance learning, there's a chance they could be deported. Um, can you speak to that policy? I'm, I'm not even sure that they have the authority to make that judgment, um, but obviously it doesn't make a lot of sense. Right now, uh, most universities are doing a hybrid. Some are going back, uh, you know, with with a, a mix of in-person classes and hybrid but you know our universities have been made tremendously stronger because of the presence of foreign students stronger in several ways first we get talent from all over the world comes in and helps make america a a, a better stronger place two let's just bottom line you've got foreign students that are paying uh tuition and bucking up uh, university systems, bottom line. Uh, so that's important to American students. They're, they're help, being helped by foreign students in terms of the money. We've had a big drop off in foreign students coming to the United States. And I think it's a product of a number of things. One, just the rhetoric uh, of this administration has been so hostile uh, to immigrants that I think it's turned off some families who decide maybe it's not a safe place to send their young people to go to school. We've made it more difficult uh, for foreign students to come in and study uh, here uh, and, um, and now this. So it's, it's not in the best interest of the United States to do this. And this is our last question. And then again, we will definitely make sure we follow up with the Congresswoman's office to get some of these others answered that we didn't have time for today. Um, but this is, I think, a good place to end. <laughs> it comes from Gloria uh, Leventhal. And she's saying that she would have loved to see you, Congresswoman, on the short list as a vice presidential uh, picks. <laughs> well, that's and, very sorry. <laughs> and she said that if you were asked to serve as a cabinet member, if Joe Biden becomes president, would you do it? Well, I think, uh, you know, if the President of the United States asks you to be a, a secretary of, in his cabinet, I think you have to say yes. I mean, I'm not seeking that. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of things I want to get done uh, legislatively. And although I've been in Congress now a long time, in the, in the years I've been there, I've only had four years with the Democratic President a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic House. And it's only when you have that alignment that you actually have a good chance of getting your bills made into law. So um, I'm looking forward to having an opportunity to get some of these measures that would really help our country enacted into law. And that's, that's what I want to do next year. Uh, I want, I'm hoping that we will get our vaccine uh, done promptly. I think it's, you know, to say it's going to be this year is probably overly optimistic, but it's absolutely so important that we be able to get beyond this and uh, to be able to make sure that our electoral systems are protected from uh, 
suppression of votes to make sure that all Americans can fully participate in the political system, to reform the immigration laws, to improve the health care system. I mean, there's so much that needs to happen. The American people are just eager uh, for that change, and I want to be part of it. So I'm hoping we'll get the chance. Thank you so much for letting me visit with all of you, and I look forward to hearing the other comments um, and questions, and it's been a real pleasure uh, to hear from everyone. Well, thank you, Congresswoman Lofgren. You know, thank you so much for the work you do fighting for us, fighting for the community and for your constituents in Washington. We know it's not easy, and we're so grateful for your leadership. And there's so many comments and people thanking you and, and really um, singing your praises, and, and you've got a lot of fans here. So <laughs> thanks for right. having to chat with us. And thank you for supporting San Jose Spotlight, and that means a lot to us as well.